Right, are we on? We on. Yay! I'm organizing, well, someone else is grabbing him a cup of coffee, the poor AV man was falling asleep, sir. <laughs> it's all working. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I have done this talk once, a um, couple of days ago at the Drupal, um, at the Drupal gang in, in Melbourne. Um, so some aspects may, may seem a bit um, too simplistic for you guys, but you can, you can fill in the blanks. What I'm going to tell you about is how Open Query, that's my company, and we do MySQL stuff mainly, um, deals with scaling and essentially saving people money. That's ourselves as well as, um, as, well as our clients. And um, we often do things fairly simplistically, but it works, um, which of course is a nice thing. So one complaint I got at the Drupal um, conference was um, that I hadn't actually said what my company did which I thought was a good thing because I don't actually want to plug what we do because that wasn't the point. But to prevent complaints, I'll tell you what I do. Um, so we do remote database maintenance under subscription. That's our main thing. Of course, you can do something like consulting training and all the other stuff, but remote database subscription is the main thing. So that means tuning ongoing. So every month we log in a couple of times and see what's going on. Um, and we also do system administration because it's all really close together from our perspective. And we also do a bit of security because I employ a couple of people who are really good with that stuff. Um, so that all ties in neatly and it's all charged under the same subscription model. And what don't we do? Emergencies. We really absolutely do not offer emergencies. Um, we do sometimes deal with them um, with a neat set of three rules. Um, and the only reason we deal with them is because of a bit of geek indulgence. So, so the three rules are, if one of our engineers feels like it um, and has the time, then we may pick up um, an emergency case. And that may be an existing client or um, someone who hasn't dealt with us before, uh, dealt with us before. And the second rule is, we charge three times our normal rate. Now that may seem really interesting, but the thing is you can charge anything you bloody like for an emergency because there's absolutely no deterrent. We could charge 10 times the amount and people would still call. So if you're trying to deter by charging more, it does not work. It, this has been tried. I know someone who once got paid thousands of dollars for 10 minutes of work. You can just work out what the hourly rate would have been. Um, there is no deterrent. So the third rule, um, but heck, basically for the geek indulgence you get paid properly and that get passed on to the engineer that, that does the job. The third rule is we will do this only once, ever, per client. And that is non-negotiable. There's no amount you can pay us that we will pick anything up after that and you can't convince us. That's as simple as that. Um, so that, that keeps it fun and, and entertaining. Because, look, sometimes a client needs help. We just must make sure that we never become the fire department. Some, um, some companies produce emergencies, and those are not the clients we want. Um, I'm quite happy to, to pass them on to what others regard as our competitors. I don't think we are in the same space, but I'm quite happy to pass them on, give them personal introductions with the CEOs, not a problem. Um, we know good people that do that, it's just not us. So, why don't we like emergencies? Because we think they're completely unnecessary. Some companies produce them, that's their... Um, I don't know, the business processes kind of create that kind of stuff. But um, you've probably read all that by now. It's the idea that um, I think is wrong. So failures in design or just work that hasn't been completed because someone has been pulled off the case to the next, you know, the next fire emergency that, that was going on. Um, one of my reasons for not liking this um, is that um, top left is my daughter. Uh, now six and a half, she was still four there, extra cute. Um, I have a new girlfriend on the right, Claire, awesome, and as a consequence I have three extra kids. Um, so um, on the left is Max, then there's Phoebe, and then um, Natasha, and then um, Caroline. Uh, Phoebe's, Phoebe's mine, the rest of them are new. So I've got way better things to do with my evenings and weekends and other spare time, you know? Um, not picking, not having that phone ring at odd hours and, and being woken up and being distracted from actually having, having real life. And I think that's really important. Um, let me put it this way. Um, who here in this room likes doing emergencies at 2 a.m. on Saturday morning? Yeah. What? Kelly. Yeah, but you're actually awake at that point. Yeah, but you don't actually want to be awake, do you? 
No, no, put your hand down. <laughs> Have a chop a chop. Um, so, prevention, better than a cue. Oh, you're a cheeky bum. <laughs> I'll get you back later. Um, so, prevention is really, really better than a cure. But is there a cure? Um, well, there's of course the commercial risk thing, the usual business decisions that happen. Um, and people have SLAs. Who here likes SLAs? Yeah, it's not a freebie. Keep your hand down. <laughs> um, <laughs> preemptive. Um, yeah, so an SLA is like, is, is, is like an insurance thing. If, if, if something bad happens at the ISP, uh, at the hosting provider, then you might get some money or some original money back or you get out of the contract or whatever. It's utterly freaking useless. So on the one hand, your, your business that was critically dependent on all this stuff is now dead um, because you may be down for a number of hours or a day and you, your business could be out of business by that time. And on the other hand, you get a check. Doesn't work. It really doesn't work. I don't want that kind of stuff. Um, my company actually doesn't offer L L um, um, doesn't, doesn't offer SLAs. It just doesn't. We do best effort. Um, we don't want to be the blame bunny when something goes wrong. We just do a better, best effort um, situation, and that's that's it. Suing me doesn't save the business. It's after the fact. So um, I need I need companies that want to deal with me on a different basis. Not that. Um, it actually helps me because I've been able to hire people who don't like emergencies either. People who have a family or just other things to do, and um, yeah, that, that kind of just works out better. So I've got a larger pool of talent to choose from. It has saved me lots in business infrastructure because I don't need to have cold, cold trickery going on. So I save money, which means I can charge my clients less, which is useful for people. Um, and it makes happiness for me. I think I probably misspelled happiness there, but anyway. Um, People ask me, so what do you do? Well, um, resilience is the thing. Uh, this, is a, this is a light in a restaurant in Wellington when someone asked me that um, a couple of years back when the Wellington LCA was on, and I looked behind me and I saw this with one of the lights broken. Um, and I think that describes the situation fairly well. Nobody had to shut down the restaurant, send everybody outside, stop everybody, stop eating everybody out, we need to change the light bulb. You don't want to do that with a website either, or an intranet, or whatever kind of business infrastructure you have. Um, so, I don't know, you could call this a lamp, lamp equivalent of a raid array or whatever, but the, the point is there's resilience built in. It delivers light, uh, with the architecture it delivers a bit of, I don't know, art or whatever, um, but the point is one or two or even four can break and you would still have enough light to, to make it work. Hold that up with lampstack. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a lamp stack. That, oh man, I've been, I've given this talk so many times now with that slide, and it's on the web page. You're the first one that comes. Thank you, Florian. It takes an Austrian to come up with that one. I'm sure. Okay, fine. You can explain that to me later. I haven't got that one. It's getting late. Okay, so backups. Of course, you need backups now. It's awesome the kind of backups you can do with particularly InnoDB. You can use the, the extra backup tool from the Percona uh, gang who, um, anyway, you can take a file system snapshot. You can use LVM to take snapshots. That's awesome and fast. However, um, that shouldn't be the only thing you do. Uh, MySQL dump and related tools actually create something um, resembling an SQL file that if anything goes dead, on the bit level, I can actually still load it in an editor and clean up the bits that I want. I can also grab out a tiny little segment and put it back in the database. That's really, really useful. So what we do for clients is always both of these. It's not a, oh, I only want physical backups, because that's what many hosting providers do. They take snapshots of the file system, and we just tell clients that's not enough. That will not do at all. We always want logical backups as well. And we also all, always take them off-site as an extra copy. We want to keep some on-site, save copying back if all our servers are still alive, but um, we want to take them away as well. Replication in MySQL is not a backup strategy. I know this is terrible news, but there you go. And I don't regard a SAN as a backup strategy either. It is just a very expensive single point of failure. Um, I've had hosting providers tell me that, SAN, that their SAN can't fail. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Yep, absolute, absolutely. Um, I prefer to not do business with that particular company. I can name them, but not on camera. I think that would be a bit too rude. Um, but they're based in Sydney. 
Um, so, multi masters are what we like. Now, we use M the MMM tool for that, which people have written about. Baron Schwartz has, uh, at Pacona has, has written about the MMM tool, and he explains all the things that are dreadfully, dreadfully wrong with, um, uh, with MMM. And he's absolutely right. Um, however, you can have a similar story about MySQL replication. There are lots of things wrong with my MySQL replication, but it works bloody well. We've been using it for over 12 years in the MySQL community and for big companies like, like the whole Yahoo infrastructure used to be built on this kind of stuff. They had in like five or six years ago, they had 8,500 MySQL servers across the planet all tied together with, with, it wasn't a single replication tree, but lots of them. Same at, um, at, at Google for AdWords and AdSense, lots of replication. It works. There's plenty of funny, funny things, but we know what the funny things are. We can manage them. Um, being aware of those bugs is a nice thing. Same for MMM. It works for us. We use version 2 of MMM because it's vastly better than number 1. Yes, it has some quirks, but we're actually seeing remarkably few hiccups with it. Um, and it does automatic failover, and that is what we actually use. Um, and our, we have absolutely no issues essentially rebooting or doing something nasty shutdown on the active master at any point, and yet it will fa fail over. We haven't had any issues with that, and we have done this in vastly different environments. Our clients now trust us to actually do that. We can do that live. I used to do demos at conferences and actually notify one of our clients beforehand that we would do this and, and get the okie dokie. We'd actually do pseudo reboot on the primary master because after a talk like this, People think, yeah, you're just saying that. No, 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 we actually do this. Um, this should be safe. You shouldn't have to plan a failover because when are you planning your next fire in the data center? You know, that's not how it works. So it should be possible to do this at any point, and that's what we did. And we'd notify them afterwards then, of course, that everything was good. And I was just chatting with, with the, one of the people we, we did that with, one of the clients, um, at the Drupal um, meeting. And um, he said, look, you can just do that now. You don't have to tell us because we just know that it'll work. That's cool. Um, I'd like to, have, to give clients that kind, of, that kind of comfort, and through experience, he has gained that kind of comfort, and I think that's really awesome. Um, of course, using replication slaves is a, is a useful thing for reads. Um, it just doesn't scale with bigger hardware for the master. It doesn't work. If you're building a new app, building it, planning ahead for, for replication slaves is an awesome thing. Make sure the system can use two connections, even though both connections might use um, the same server at that point. It's not just splitting reads and writes, because some reads actually do need to use the master. Um, for instance, if you were to store sessions in the MySQL server or do thing, things like shopping carts, um, the slave is always slightly behind. So if you do a write and you do a read really quickly, you might not get the results yet. Um, so those reads should go to the master. Of course, also in a transaction, reads that go with the writes in the transaction, they all need to be at the master, obviously. So you can't just split it with a simple proxy um, or just split it off with a simple check in your, in your uh, application layer. You need to actually do something smarter. So if you build it into the app properly, that works really well. It can be done later, it takes a little bit more work. I don't have to talk to you guys about this, do I? No. About what the replication layout is? Oh, that one? No? All good. Um, I'll briefly mention the top bit. Technically, the master-master environment is a circle. You know, A to B, B to A. Um, and yes, you can do circular replication in MySQL beyond two nodes. So you can do three, four, five, whatever. You can run a circle. This works really, really well until one of them breaks. Because that's what we're trying to, to deal with. Not prevent, because they will fail. Any machine will fail. Um, but um, the moment it breaks, you actually need to stick it together at the correct positions and make sure everything is happy. And that's the problem. So we do not use more than two servers in this context. Okay? So when we go to a second data center, we actually, or from an old infrastructure to new infrastructure, we chain it. So we make one the slave of the original master, and then make the second prospective master a slave of the, the first new one, and then we cut the tie at the end and then glue them together. Um, and that neatly works. That is a zero, a zero downtime environment. So we can actually move from an old infrastructure or an old data center to a new one without any downtime. The, the, clients, um, the clients' users don't notice that, we have any, uh, that we've changed um, to a new uh, center. 
this is the rough line that we that we take with clients. And you can you can tweak around a bit with with some of the steps, um, but this is essentially what I've been telling the Drupal gangs um, that that we do, and that I think that also applies fairly well to to other environments. So the very first thing we do with clients is well a little bit of baseline tuning. So we clean up the worst situation because most servers that we find out there are pretty much not tuned, or people have used one of those tuning scripts. Um, or even worse, the tuning scripts are not that bad in some cases, but they're not particularly smart about the context that the application is using in because they have no idea about that. The main issue is when people use those um, sample configurations that come with the MySQL distro. You know, my dash huge dot cfg, which which indicates that you may actually have four gigs of RAM. Yes. So much RAM. That is so much RAM. Yes, it's about the amount of RAM that my laptop has, uh, which admittedly is not that much these days. But yeah, and, and a regular server doesn't have that. Um, so yeah, that's not particularly useful. They actually contain some hideously incorrect things. Uh, they do things with the temporary tables settings that are actually incorrect, completely incorrect. Do not use those configuration files. Um, if you grab readyb. They actually, there's actually a sample configuration file that's more sane, and in due time, I hope we can get rid of those my dash whatever. Uh, the problem is in the build system, it, they're kind of tied into other things, so I try to rip them out um, in, in, in my um, BZR repo and, and, and tripped over some things and discussions. And It's part politics, part technicalities that, that keep them in there. Um, okay, so now one, once we've cleaned up the, 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 the general mess, uh, the main thing is splitting the web server and the database server, if it's a single system. After that, we can create multiple database servers, we can create multiple web servers, and it works much easier. So the very first step, we must split that. Um, it, it also resolved the issue where both the web server and the database server are competing for RAM. Um, disk I.O., all of those issues are resolved by that first step and makes everything else possible. Um, in the case of Drupal, we often stick varnish in front, which is essentially proxy caching, all kinds of trickery. Um, Memcached is a useful tool. I don't care if you use Memcached or something else that does something similar, but it works really, really well. The only way you can scale um, applications is not necessarily by creating this fantastic infrastructure that can handle queries really well, but in some cases it's just a matter of not running a certain query. Um, and that is really, really important. The fastest query is still the one you don't run. Um, Sphinx Search and Solar and other, other full text tools. Um, oh, that's more time than I thought. Excellent. Cool, thank you. Um, 10 minutes left. Um, full text indexing trickery, do it outside the database. Um, my ISOM has full text. In it be from, what is it, 5.5 or 5.6 at Oracle also has full text, but Essentially, it's a bit of a hack inside, and there's external systems that do it much, much better, much, much faster. The MyISM full text system gets slower the more data you put in, and it also becomes um, slower with the selects. That's not so cool. Um, Sphinx is vastly superior to that uh, behavior, and, and Solar and others are as well. So if you need to do full text indexing, please split it off. In any case, you do want everything converted to, to InnoDB wherever possible. You don't want my ISM tables. So that's another reason. Once you've done the, the solar and swing stuff to get rid of the full text, then another step in between is moving things to InnoDB if you haven't yet. We still have some clients that do use my ISM, particularly when they first come to us. And one of the things is we do try to get them to InnoDB. The trick is, of course, we can't get them to InnoDB unless we have a system that we can allocate enough RAM on. So yes, we need to tune it. But in some cases, we need to split the web and the database first so we have enough RAM to play with. An untuned InnoDB server is worse than an untuned MyAsm server, even if you take the locking differences into account. Um, InnoDB must be tuned to behave um, in a way that actually performs decently well. Um, so after that, our infrastructure has changed a bit. We make sure that the backups are uh, where they need to be. In many cases, our clients do not necessarily have backups at all or backups that are sane. So in some cases, a, uh, a hosting provider or the client themselves just make physical copies of a database directory, and we know that doesn't work. Um, so we, we clean that up. Um, 
After that, we can go from a single database to dual masters. Having a backup at that point, of course, is really interesting. Um, it's useful. Monitoring trending, we happen to use Zabbix, and we used to do that internally, and Zabbix is essentially a fancy looking version of Nagios. Um, it just makes things look pretty, and we have separate logins for us and for clients. So we can actually give our clients pretty screens that, that trend over time, and, it's, and we can send alerts, SMSs, we can do all kinds of funky stuff that they want. Um, so the CEO can actually have a pretty screen um, that they can look at knowing that their servers are online. And that can actually be really beneficial. It sounds a bit silly, but giving a CEO or CTO that kind of page can really make their day, week, month, and can make them happy with you. Um, so we used to do that internally. We've now outsourced that. One of our engineers actually created a startup called Tribally, and um, we kind of make them do it now. But it's still inclusive for our clients. We just have outsourced it from our end. Works better. Security and penetration testing is something we do now. Um, among other people, um, Daniel Black there. Go on, stick your hand up there. He's one of our guilty parties that does that. He knows a lot of stuff about it. You may have talked to him before and know this. Um, and then we like Puppet. Now, we don't try to stick Puppet in every single environment that we get to. That would be a bit too indulgent. But any system that has enough servers or enough complex complexity to make that interesting, we do try to get that in there. Um, in particular, if people talk to us about environments and using little servers to um, to scale out in the way that I've, I've described, we often go to Linode. And we now have a fairly decent grip on um, doing the puppet thing with Linode and starting up new servers and all that kind of stuff. And Dan has also been one of the people who's been working on that. Um, we often move people from Apache to Nginx. Um, who here prefers Apache? Yeah, that's a large majority of a half. Are you sticking your hand up, Stuart? Yeah. Yeah, all right. All right. It's installed and it works. Fair enough. Okay. <laughs> okay. We're not here in one of those VI, you know, VI Emacs things. Uh, um, okay. Who here likes Nginx? Yeah, that's a fairly reasonable crowd. Um, Lighty? No? Other stuff? What do you like if you don't like the others? What? Emacs as a web server, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Okay. What, what's that? Sold by default. That'll be Apache, I think. Yeah. Um, okay. Doesn't matter. Anyway, we often move from Apache to N Nginx. We find that it's, from our perspective, nicer to control. We can we can make it. We can make it behave in the way we we want in terms of number of connections it allows, amount of memory it uses, the actual speed with which it handles certain things. Um, we find it more predictable and more manageable. That could be just a subjective thing because I know that there are really, really competent people with Apache who say they can do similar things and I fully believe that, um, but we can do that with Nginx. Now if the client wants to stay with Apache, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying that if we set up a web server and we have a choice of what we use, we like Nginx. We've also played with Lighty, um, Lighty HTTPD, um, I know the author who, who wrote that, Jan Kneske, awesome, but we like Nginx better now. It seems to do all the things we need with a fairly low amount of effort compared to what, what needs to be done elsewhere. Um, once that's done, we can move from a single web server to multiple. Of course, it creates redundancy. Uh, MySQL slaves, nice thing for reads and so on. Cross data center failover, I've already mentioned something about that. Many clients don't actually want that because it adds a cost factor. We have to keep like a single, well, a simplified version of that entire infrastructure available on the other end. Yeah, so two masters that are in a chain, um, so essentially they're both slaves, um, at least one database server and possibly Sphinx server and all the other stuff, and then we can do the failover. It's not a failover data center that then gets failed back, it's a secondary data center. If there were a failover and we don't do that automatically, then that becomes the primary and we just reset the original with Puppet and start everything from scratch. Two minutes or something? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, now, one of the reasons, apart from all that resilience, that we use dual masters is it makes it so much easier for us to do maintenance. We can actually add an index in the infrastructure without um, causing a bit of locking or downtime or anything like that. I don't believe in scheduled downtime. I just want the, whole, the system as a whole to just remain online all the time. Um, so we can add an index on the non-active master. We can also add an index on one of the slaves, and we make, can make sure that that doesn't replicate. There's settings for that in MySQL. Then we, we switch 
using MMM, we just tell it to do a forced, forced essentially failover, and, um, and we can add the index on the other side. So you just keep an eye on those things, and that works perfectly well. Um, upgrades of, of MySQL and other components, uh, system upgrades that require reboots, kernel upgrades are sometimes necessary for security. That we do again on the password master and, and on one of the slaves, and then we just do a bit of a rolling upgrade that way. It just works really, really well. Um, for, for that purpose. So it's a, it's a management as well as a technicality um, there. Uh, so this is a bit of an overview of the kind of stuff we use. Um, extra trickery that we get with MariaDB, I really like. Uh, we just get some extra, some extra um, logging information, some, some commands and, and other stuff that just make our life as administrators much easier. Um, the engines that get built into MariaDB we also like better. They scale better in case of InnerDB, which is the extra DB fork. Um, if you do use federated tables, there's a better version of that. It has the graph engine that I designed some years ago. It has it built into MariaDB 5.2 and up. So if you're dealing with hierarchies or, or trees, you can actually do that in plain SQL and it's built in there. And there's a couple of others, including Sphinx engine, um, to talk directly to the full text Sphinx system and then join those results onto the rest of your, your database and, and, and use that in your application. So it just has a number of useful things there. Um, we use MMM, as I mentioned. We use the math kit, which is now called Pertona, tool, Pertona Toolkit. One of the main things we need to do, of course, with replicated infrastructure and also the dual masters, is um, do regular synchronization checks. Replication, like we said, um, like was mentioned before, does fail in funny ways, and you don't always notice. So doing replication checks is important. What we need to do with the MathKit synchronization check, as well as with MySQL dump, you actually need to throttle the I.O. rate. Um, yes, they can work really, really well, but they eat up all the I.O. on your system, so you actually need to tone them down. Now, because both of them can work without any locking, you can actually just make them run much slower, and you can just run them over a couple of hours, and that'll work just nicely. Without locking, of course, only works if you use InnerDB, not with MyArsha. Um, and the rest of the, the list is, of course, fairly, fairly clear. Um, we do encourage our clients, if, they, if they're building a web app or something and they're not using revision control yet, to use something. If they aren't using anything yet, we recommend to use one of BZR, Git, Mercurial. That's all perfectly fine. Um, if they are already using SVN, then we don't try to convert them. Uh, we mention that we think that those are better systems, but we don't really push the issue there because it's better to use that than nothing. Um, we're not going to argue that, but if we do have a choice, we recommend those because they, they do save a lot of sanity. Okay, quick questions. Up there, run, run. I've gone through probably uh, steps one to ten with several small startups over the years. Uh, okay. What, what kind of um, time frame do you usually look at for, for an average size small company, just out of interest? Depends entirely on the budget. So in some cases clients want this, they have an existing setup, but they'd like a new setup. So in a matter of a couple of months, Again, it's a timeline and it, it, there's testing along the way because if you move from one data center to another, lots of infrastructure changes. So they might want to change the app, for instance, from, from full text to, to Sphinx. Um, the web server might change and at least some things in uh, PHP versions might change and it might need to adapt things. Lots of things need to be tested. So the main factor is, is apart from the budget, um, testing and just waiting for people to have time enough to, to do stuff. Um, so there's no single answer. We don't really try to do this in a two-week time frame or whatever. It's not worthwhile. It just stresses everybody out. Um, it's actually quite nice to do this over time. Of course, I'd love to have backups as the very first thing. That'd be awesome. But in some cases, it's really, really more important to keep the website online now because otherwise having backups you know, it doesn't matter either because there's nothing to actually take a backup of if the business is online. You know, you have to make choices. I think there's someone. Does that answer your question adequately? Okay. Six to? Six to 18 months. I think that's entirely sane. Yes. Hello. Okay, yep. Um, with the multi master, there's always the possibility of getting like a split plane sort of thing happening. Does MMM handle all that? Or inconsistency? Like if something accidentally gets written to the wrong master? Inconsistency, yes. Split brain, no. 
Um, MMM works with a floating IP address. So servers do not talk to one or the other, they talk to one IP address. And the IP address can't be in both places at one on the same lab. Um, do not do this via DNS or other trickery. Uh, you can in theory, but it's a really, really bad idea. So um, the, virtual, the virtual IP address gets flipped across um, using gratuitous ARP responses. Um, it's fairly simple, but it's a standard thing that's usually used by the Linux HA stuff that's been in use over, I don't know, 10, 12 more years. It works. Um, and there's no switch that I've seen yet that, or switch or router that actually doesn't deal with that kind of trickery. Um, so that works really well. Um, yes, in theory, the, slave, uh, the, the second master can get out of sync with the first. Of course, you need to track errors, warnings, that kind of stuff. You need to run Matkit regularly, but essentially, in many cases, it's more important that things are online and mostly up to date, and then you can clean the rest up with Matkit, um, rather than having things completely dead. And or you know the failovers from a master to a slave, and then you clean up the stuff, and then the slave becomes the new master. That is much more complicated than doing it with these because they're equals. There's no main and a failover. They're absolute equals. It doesn't matter whether the server talks to A or B. But it's very important to realize that the two masters are not doing load balancing because any write on the one needs to, sorry, hang on. Um, whatever write happens on server A needs to be written on server B as well. So write load balancing makes no sense at all. Read bo load balancing is what clients sometimes do briefly or longer if we really don't like it. Um, because of budget constraints, they don't yet have slaves organized, but it prevents us from actually doing work on the second server, as I just described, so we don't like that. So you could do read load balancing, but it's not really a good idea, split it off. Um, and once you can talk to another server, you might as well do the slave thing. So does that answer your question? Excellent. Uh, you are using MariaDB, uh, but Preferably. I haven't, I haven't uh, seen packages for it, or at least it seems hard to, um, uh, at least um, particularly with uh, Red Hat systems, there doesn't seem to be any prospect mm -hmm. of packaging for a while. Um, do you have uh, packaged MariaDB, or do you? Yes. Do okay. It's do you really short package answer. it yourself? Or? Um, we used to. Right. Um, so for 5.0, um, Open Query was wrapping up uh, MySQL in RPMs and, and also Debian packages and repositories actually for both. Hmm. Um, so Debian, Ubuntu, um, and um, Red Hat, and CentOS. Um, there were a number of patches that we added. Then uh, Monty, Monty started doing MariaDB. Those patches were ported to 5.1, and we handed over essentially our build scripts to Monty program. So now those same things are used for 5.2 and, and so on. Um, and on the MariaDB site, you will also find the packages, which you can just download. Not all the repositories are available via MariaDB.com. Uh, some are still at ourdelta.org, so O-U-R-D-E-L-T-A.org. No, and Percona also has a number of repositories. You just need to actually look at which ones you want and so on. Um, yes, they should all be in a single place again, and uh, my engineers and I will get them back at our delta so that they all appear again. It's just that in the changeover, um, essentially that broke our internal infrastructure where we had the build environment and the repositories in the same space. Now we need to grab the files back from Montebrugham, put them in our infrastructure, and we haven't got that bit done. So. They are there, but you may at the moment have to download them or ask me or someone else where are the repositories this week. Um, <laughs> they haven't actually changed, I just don't memorize it. Maybe, maybe Dan already behind us knows, knows where they are now because yeah, I just haven't dealt with that recently. But they do exist. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, all right, we're gonna leave it at that, I think. So um, thank you, Ian. Thank you. Cheers.